Fuzzy Mud by Lewis Sacker. Chapter 31. Wednesday, November 3rd. Evening. Marshall walked between Tamea and Chad, an arm guiding each of them. He wore only one shoe, having given the other to Tamea. It was way too big for her, but she was glad for the protection, even if it flopped a bit with every step she took. She could still see blurry shapes up close, just like Chad had described, but only if they were right in front of her face. She had lost track of time. She had no idea how far they'd gone or how much farther they had to go. Do you know the way? she asked Marshall. I think so. Look for a white tree with a branch that sticks out. It points the way back. There are a lot of white trees. Also a big tall tree with wood planks nailed to it, she told him. That's Chad's tree. That's how he saw us yesterday. I have more than one tree, said Chad. I climb up one, and then I see one that seems taller, so I climb that one. I want to try to find the highest tree out here. That's cool, said Marshall. You think? I figured you'd all think it was stupid, like I was a little kid or something. No, that's way too scary for a little kid, said Marshall. Too scary for me, Tamea agreed. You? No way, said Chad. You're not scared of anything. I'll take you guys up sometime. There are some boards at the top you can sit on. Once again, Tamea could hear renewed energy in Chad's voice as he talked about his trees. You can see for miles, said Chad. For miles. That was nice to imagine, considering she and Chad couldn't even see for inches. Marshall stopped suddenly. Tamea felt him tighten his grip on her arm. Chad must have felt it too. What's wrong? he asked. Shh! Marshall, Marshall whispered. I hear something. Tamea listened. It sounded like the scattering of leaves and dirt. Something was moving. Some kind of animal, or maybe several animals. Chad, she whispered, when you were up in your tree, did you really ever see the crazy hermit and his black wolves? I saw a guy with a beard. No wolves. The sound grew louder. There was definitely more than one animal. A dog barked. It was coming toward them. More barking from more than one dog. A dog barked right in front of Tamea. She cringed, but Marshall said, It's not going to hurt you. I think maybe we're rescued. From a distance, she heard a man's voice call, They went this way! She bent down and tentatively reached out to soft, warm fur. A wet tongue licked her face. Oh, don't do that, she said, not wanting the dog to get her rash. They're here, someone shouted. And the next thing she knew, there were lots of voices talking all at once. Are you injured? How did you get here? Did someone hurt you? They're both blind, Marshall said. There's something bad in the mud out here. She heard what sounded like someone talking on a phone. We got em. All three, two boys and a girl. We're going to need an ambulance. No, they say they weren't abducted, but we'll keep searching. Tamea felt a hand on her shoulder. You're safe now, said a man's voice. I'm going to carry you back to the school, and then you'll be taken to the hospital. Careful. I'm all covered in mud, she warned. The man chuckled and said, A little mud never hurt anyone. She felt his arms wrap around her, and he lifted her up off the ground. Tamea was too cold and too tired and too sore to try to explain. It was too late now anyway. She let herself sink into his warm wool coat. He'd find out about the mud soon enough. They all would. As he carried her out of the woods, she asked the names of the dogs. The one that you were petting is Missy, short for Miss Marple. We also have Nero, Sherlock, and Rockford, all names of famous detectives. Because they're good at finding people? They're the best. I love dogs, said Tamea. Chapter 32, Turtles. The following is excerpted from the Heathcliff disaster hearings held three months after Tamea was carried out of the woods. Senator Wright, were you able to determine if these organisms were, in fact, the same as the organisms that were used in Bioline? Dr. June Lee, research scientist, National Institutes of Health. The DNA is nearly identical, but not exact. We believe that they are mutated strains of the Bioline organisms. Senator Foote. 
But aren't there millions of different kinds of microorganisms living in, on this planet? Dr. Jun Lee, yes. Senator Foote, and most of these have never been studied. Dr. Jun Lee, that's true. Scientists have identified only about 5% of all the microbes in our biosphere. Senator Foote, so isn't it possible that the organisms found in the fuzzy mud could have evolved naturally from one of these unknown microbes? Dr. Jun Lee, no, that is highly unlikely. Senator Foote, but not impossible? Dr. Jun Lee, highly unlikely. If it had evolved naturally, then almost certainly it would have adapted to the cold climate. Senator Foote, what caused the mutation? How did it happen? Dr. Jun Lee, I can't say. Every time a cell divides, there's the very small possibility of a mutation. But with billions upon billions of divisions occurring all the time, mutations will happen. It's inevitable. Senator Foote, how did this supposedly mutated organism get from Sunray Farm to the woods of Heathcliff? Dr. Jun Lee, again, we don't know. A bug, a bird, a wind current, anything could have brought it. Senator Wright, even if all you say is true, Dr. Lee, the important question is this. Is the original organism dangerous? I'm talking about the one currently used in BioLean, not the mutation. Is it dangerous either to people or to the environment? Dr. Jun Lee, no. Since the original organism cannot survive in oxygen, it poses no danger. But like I said, mutations will occur. As far as what those future mutations may be, I cannot say. But there will be more mutations. That is a certainty. Senator Wright, thank you, doctor, for your testimony and for your work at NIH. The country is very grateful that you and your agency were able to find a cure for this horrible disease. Dr. Jun Lee, thank you, but it act but actually it was Dr. Crumbly, a local veterinarian, who discovered the cure. We at NIH helped in the testing and mass production, but it is Dr. Crumbly who deserves your thanks. Senator Haltings, excuse me, did you say Dr. Crumbly is a vet? Dr. Jun Lee, animals suffer just as badly as humans. If it weren't for Dr. Crumbly, I suppose in the future the earth would have been ruled by turtles. Chapter 33, Frankengerms. The man who rescued Tamea did find out soon enough. The whole world found out about the mud. Within hours of the children's rescue, everyone who had been involved in the search began showing signs of the rash. Redness, small bumps, a tingling sensation. By the next morning, many of these bumps had turned into blisters, and people awoke to find a mysterious powder the color of their skin on their bedsheets. As it turned out, the powder was their skin, or what was left of it, after the mutated organisms ate the good parts. One week after Tamea, Chad, and Marshall were found in the woods, there were more than 500 cases of the rash in the town of Heathcliff. After two weeks, the number had grown to 15,000. Many people didn't seek treatment until it was too late. One of the most insidious things about the rash was that there was no pain, just a mild tingling sensation. Normally, nerve cells send a pain message to the brain, but the microorganisms ate through the portion of the cells that, transmitted the that transmits the message. It was like a telephone line had been cut. The nerve cells were screaming, Help! Alert! Danger! But the brain never got the message. About the same time that Tamea, Marshall, and Chad were being loaded into an ambulance, the researchers found the dead body of a person who had been living in the woods a man with a very long beard. The three lost children were rushed to Heathcliff Regional Hospital. Samples of the mud were taken from Tamea's hair and clothes and sent to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta and to the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Photos of her arm, of her hand and arm, as well as Chad's face were emailed to those agencies as well. The doctors at the hospital searched the medical books and internet but could find no record of this type of rash. There was no known cure. The best they could do for Tamea was to keep her extremely clean. She was thoroughly washed. Her hair was cut off and her head was shaved. For the next few weeks, she was given round-the-clock sponge baths every two hours, morning, noon, and night. A nurse would wash her and 
with rubbing alcohol. After each bath, she had to rinse her mouth with a special mouthwash. It stung and tasted terrible, and she had to keep it in her mouth for a minute before they allowed her to spit it out. She didn't mind one bit. It tasted strong. Her mother and then, and then later her father, came to visit, although they weren't allowed to touch her. She told them she was sorry, but they kept on telling her how proud they were of her. Later, as the epidemic spread through Heathcliff, all visitors were banned from the hospital, including her parents. She could still talk to them on her cell phone, which her father had given to her. Her vision didn't deteriorate any further. If she held her hand in front of her face, she could see it was her hand, but that might have been because she already knew it was her hand. Her doctor tried various other shapes and objects. She could correctly identify a circle, a square, and a triangle, but when he held up a woman's high-heeled shoe, she guessed it was a banana. She asked often about Marshall and Chad. She heard Marshall was doing fairly well, but she wasn't allowed to see him. Chad was in very serious condition. That was all she could find out about him. She was told that if he had arrived at the hospital even 20 minutes later, he probably wouldn't have survived. She never complained. Sometimes, when she felt scared, she'd repeat to herself the ten virtues that she'd been made to memorize at Woodridge Academy. Charity, cleanliness, courage, empathy, grace, humility, integrity, patience, prudence, temperance. Partly, she thought that if she was really, really good, then the rash would go away and she'd be able to see again. Deep down, she was also preparing herself for the worst, in case she didn't get better. She wanted to be able to face the world with courage, patience, and grace. She learned to recognize her different nurses, not only by their voices, but also by the sounds they made when they entered her room to give her another sponge bath. Everyone continued to assure her that the best scientists in the country were working on a, on a cure. Everyone acted so calm and reassuring around her. It was only when she talked to Monica that she found out that the rest of the world was totally freaked out. The fuzzy mud's everywhere, Monica told her. Schools closed, not just Woodridge, all schools. No one goes outside. I'm not even supposed to talk to you because my mom's afraid the Frankengerms will come through the phone. Everyone called up fuzzy mud, the term Tamea had used when she'd arrived at the hospital. Even the scientists, who could, who could be seen throughout Heathcliff dressed in their hazmat suits, called it that. Dr. Humbert, a, Humbert, a former employee of Sunray Farm, appeared on all the cable news shows, which was probably why the mutated organisms were now being called frankengerms. The hospital ran out of room, and schools were turned into rash treatment centers. Cots were set up in the classrooms and cafeterias. Sheets were hung to provide privacy for the round-the-clock sponge baths administered by dedicated nurses who also wore full hazmat suits. The president ordered that Heathcliff and the surrounding area be put under quarantine. No one was allowed to leave, whether or not they showed symptoms of the rash. The airport and railroad stations were closed. The Pennsylvania National Guard patrolled the roads and highways.